I'm glad I'm head of fintech, not technology, um, because clearly that wouldn't be the best start. But um, so my name's Warren Mead. I lead KPMG's global fintech practice. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Mr. Fintech. Now, <laughs> I've I've called this presentation "Who Ate My Lunch?" because, in a sense, my fear is that in 10 years' time, some of the big incumbent banks are going to look back and look at all of the fintech companies that have eaten their lunch over the last 10 years. Um, the BBVA chairman said recently that he felt that almost half of the world's banks would go out of business because of the competitive threat of fintech. Now, I'm not sure whether I agree with that or not, but I certainly think the flip side to that is that at least half of the world's banks are going to thrive because of the collaboration with fintech. So I think we've reached a really critical point in the evolution of fintech where the debate goes away from competition but towards collaboration. Now, just a few stats on fintech to get us started. Two out of three dollars in the US that's being paid through contactless systems is all going through Apple Pay. There's over Eight, is it 800, 800 billion dollars going through prepaid cards in the US. So that's 800 billion dollars of individual transactions that the banks are no longer seeing. So the banks are being disintermediated or taken away from the customer. And really at the heart of what banks need to do is get, getting back to the customer. And PayPal alone, over a billion transactions in the first quarter of this year. So clearly a huge, huge movement going on, particularly in the US on fintech. Um, and at the same time, the largest banks in the, around the world, these 16 of them, they've spent over $300 billion on conduct-related costs, on fines, on remediation. So they've still got at least one view on the, on the rear view, one eye on the rear view mirror. So I think we're at what I call our e-book moment in fintech. If you, again, wind the clock back 10 years, the publishing industry, the e-book had, had barely been invented. Amazon was a very, very small business. But what they did, they disrupted both the distribution method and the format of books, okay? Such that um, if you go back uh, now, over one in five books is sold through electro electronic format. In 2009, it was only a percent. So a massive and very quick swing to a different uh, way of doing business. And I think we're at that same point with banking. If you were to ask millennials in the US, what would they tell you? Well, they would tell you that the single greatest industry at risk of disruption is banking. This one here, you can see. And that 73% of them are more excited about what Google and Amazon and Square are doing than their own bank. So it's clear there's a case here for more collaboration in fintech for the incumbent banks. If you go back to the basics of what banks do, it's three things. They do savings, they do lending, and they facilitate payments. Now, all three parts of this value chain are being disrupted by fintech. Whether it's peer-to-peer -peer lenders, a host of e-wallets, whether it's cryptocurrencies, a whole bunch of them. The traditional thinking is that for banks, you should compete against fintech on those top three things, on deposits, payments, and lending. And where you collaborate with fintech is in the back office. You use them for helping with biometric solutions, for example, or helping uh, manage your risk. Now, I think the model's changing, and I've seen this with many of the big banks that I've started talking to. They're moving to a model where fintech is actually at the heart of all they're doing. The thinking about, okay, how do I use fintech to improve the way I engage with my customers on lending? And I'll come back to this in a bit more detail. But really, now is the time to shift to collaboration, not competition with fintech. I'm just going to focus on three areas of that disruption. The first around digital banking, the second around the peer-to-peer -peer platforms, and then the third around payments. So in terms of the digital banks, um, actually, some interesting stats here from the US again. If you go back 10 years, uh, uh, to, sorry, 2010, just five years, about 10% of mortgage lending uh, was originated by non-banking institutions. 
That number now is much more significant. In fact, five of the top 10 mortgage lenders in the US are non-banks. And many of these are tech-enabled or tech, you know, facilitate, use um, advanced technology, end-to-end -end processing, that kind of thing, where the banks with their large legacy IT systems really struggle to compete. And if you think about how that might play through into transactional banking, I've mocked up here what the, the digital bank of the future looks like. So here's your internet landing page, okay? Uh, here's some transactions. How many people's bank statements look like this at the moment? Anyone? No? Um, so here we are, you can see it's lunch with David was the first thing that came through. Um, and there's a photo of David there that's been pulled from my Facebook account. It's offering me 10% off my next visit. I can even book a table right there and then from my bank account for the next time I want to visit that restaurant. I can even request a share of the bill from David and it'll send an automatic notification that he needs to pay me my half of the bill. <clears throat> your bank will forecast your balance. It'll tell you you're not going to have enough money this month to meet your bills if you want an overdraft, or if you've got too much money, it'll help you manage that through to savings. It will warn you about bills that traditionally you've paid at this time of the month, but you haven't. Um, and it might even, top right, it might even populate your tax return for you. All of the technology for all of these things is available now in fintech companies around the world, but very, very few of the incumbent banks have adopted this yet, although some of them have plans to do so. So in this kind of world, how do you compete? The answer is you can't really. You have to start collaborating. Let's turn to peer-to-peer. -to -peer. And we heard a little bit about peer-to-peer -peer from the previous speaker. <clears throat> I think this graph shows it all. This is Lending Club in the US and their quarterly advances. Last quarter, it reached 1.6 billion, <clears throat> which, in, you know, how many banks in the room would like that kind of growth record? It really is phenomenal. Um, and it's not just Lending Club in the US, it's Prosper, it's SoFi. In the UK, we've got Funding Circle and Zopa and Ratesetter, all doing great things in this industry. Why are they being so successful? Well, I think they're a game changer. And I think they're a game changer because of these five Cs. In banking, there are five Cs that you need to have in order to be successful. And on each of these, in my view, peer-to-peer -peer has at least one structural advantage. I'm not going to go through them all, but on customers, a recent survey from the UK showed that 80% of customers that had used the peer-to-peer -peer platform would reuse that platform above its traditional bank, even if the terms were the same. So customers like the service they're getting. It's end-to-end, -end, it's straight through, it's quick. On credit, some of the platforms are starting to use more advanced indicators of creditworthiness. So far in the US, they use the score that you get at university, your grades at university and the course you studied as, a, as an enhancement to your credit score because it's a great um, indicator of your ability to repay. Some companies are even starting to use social media data to enhance credit scoring. So they can look into your Facebook or your Twitter accounts use linguistic programming and think about how is, that how is that gonna change your willingness to repay. I'll just pick up on cost and capital. On cost, there's been studies that show that the peer-to-peer -peer platforms have a two-thirds advantage on incumbent banks in terms of operating costs. That's massive and it's gonna take a generation before the banks are gonna be able to close that gap. It's things like the branch infrastructure, the expensive legacy IT systems, um, all those kind of things that the peer-to-peer -peer platforms don't have. And on capital, an example from the UK, if a bank and a peer-to-peer -peer platform were to hold the same loan book, the bank would have to hold 80, 80 times more capital than the peer-to-peer -peer platform. Those are huge advantages. So... Moving on to payments, there are so many examples of payment companies which are disintermediating banks. I can't hope to cover them all. Just one example from me, because I think this illustrates how fintech is not just changing the face of the way we do payments, but also has the potential to change the way we lead our lives. 
This is a company called Bionim. They're based in Canada, and they're in live trials with MasterCard. And they have an authentication product which monitors your heart pattern, a unique heart pattern that each of us have. It's a band called the NIMI. You can use the NIMI to unlock any physical key, whether it's your home, your car. You can use it to unlock any electronic item where you have a password. So you can wave the band over your iPhone, over your um, laptop, and it will unlock it. And most relevant to today, you can use it for payments. You can wave it over a contactless uh, terminal in a, uh, in a store, and it will, it will pay your bills. So, you know, this is really changing the whole way you lead your life, not just your, the way you um, do your finances. And with the advent of the Apple Watch and equivalents, you can imagine how this technology could easily be embedded into that and really transform the way that we, we operate. So, can the, can the banks fight back, however? Yes, absolutely, and banks have their own inherent strengths. I think the two biggest ones that banks have... One is trust. Now, I know people think that trust in banking um, has waned away, but still, customers trust their banks, and they tend to be quite loyal to them. The evidence shows that. And secondly, um, around customers, many, many, many of the fintech companies that I speak to struggle getting customers because they don't have established distribution <laughs> routes. And the banks have phenomenal distribution, a wonderful customer base, so I would argue if you bring the best of the banks together with the best of fintech, you create a new generation of financial services, one that's better for clients um, and better for the economy. So how does that look like in practice? I've got some steps to collaboration here. So first off, you have to be more customer focused. Most of the banks I talk to don't even have a single customer view yet. So if a customer's got a mortgage and a customer's separately got... A uh, current account, they, they don't necessarily know. That has to change. That's a basic foundation for the rest of this. Secondly, improve cost efficiency. Uh, I, I've spoken to quite a number of banks recently about having their own captive peer-to-peer -peer platforms or their own standalone digital banks. This is a way to effectively create low-cost platforms uh, within the banks. Improve agility. So banks, many of the banks now have their own incubator labs uh, where they test develop these things, but very few have incubator brands. I would go further than the lab. You need, you need to set up a brand within a brand and test things and get them to market quickly there. And then finally, in terms of improving use of data, I would urge the banks to start thinking about all these wider, wider use of data in order to get to customers and make the right credit decisions. So that's it from me. If you've got any questions, do please grab me in the break. Um, here's my contact details. Also, the contact details of my colleague Eileen here in Israel. Um, we have fintech hubs in seven countries in the world. We're very committed to this market, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you very much.